peace, the peace that passes all understanding. And so we're going to get into our Bible study tonight. If you're joining us, we are starting Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 tonight. And we're just going to read a few verses down. Because as I said last week, uh, we may not be able to get through everything today. And so I'm just going to read maybe from verse uh, 1 through 6. And then we'll take it from there. I'm reading from the Amplified Version, and the Amplified Version begins like this. What shall we say to all this? Are we to remain in sin in order that God's grace, favor, and mercy may multiply and overflow? Verse 2, certainly not. How can we who died to sin live in it any longer? Verse 3. Are you ignorant of the fact that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Verse 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by the baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, so we too might habitually live and behave in newness of life. Verse 5, for if we have become one with him by sharing a death like his, we shall also be one with him in sharing his resurrection by a new life lived for God. I think we'll stop there at verse 5 for tonight. And so what I wanted you to understand is that um, we've just come through chapter 5 which took us a few weeks to come through chapter 5. And so Paul, having proved both the sinfulness of Jews and Gentiles alike, that both must be redeemed alike by Christ uh, through his through faith and grace, Paul takes up this argument of dealing with sin and the secret to living a victorious Christian life. So that is what chapter 6 basically is about. But it's not just chapter 6 of Romans that deals with this victorious life. Uh, It's going to extend into Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8 as well. He's going to show us how we live this life of victory, how we attain victory over sin. And so he wants us to know something. And that's why he begins chapter 6 by asking that question. Are we to remain in sin that God's grace and favor may multiply and overflow the same way that we understood from chapter 5 that the abundance of grace dealt with man's heinous sin and the abundance of sin where it says where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. So we understand that all of the sins that we have, grace covers it. So In chapter 6, he's saying, just because you have this abundance of grace to deal with sin, doesn't mean that we keep sinning, that we can prove that his grace is enough. But then he answers the question, no. No, we don't have to continue in sin to prove that God's grace is enough to cover sin because we have the ability to live a life of victory over sin. And so chapter 6 shows us how we can live this life of victory. But there's something that we must understand is what Paul is trying to tell us. And so from verses 1 to 10 in chapter 6, he tells us that we must know something. We must know. We must understand 
understand and know basic Christian doctrine. So that's what he's going to explain in these 10 verses of Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 10. We're going to only deal with up to verse 5 tonight, but just as a matter of um, information, if you look at verse 3, verse 6, and verse 9, they talk about knowing. And wherever you see a repeat of certain vocabulary, certain words that are repeated, it means that it's important. And so that's how you know that Paul was saying the knowledge of basic Christian doctrine will show you how to attain a life of victory. In the King James Version, verse 3 says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Are you aware of this? It's important to know. And verse 6 asks another question. It says in the King James, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And then we jump down to verse 9, and again we see, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. So these three verses actually tell us that we need a knowledge. We must know basic Christian doctrine. And so, this is why Christian living depends on Christian learning. We cannot be ignorant. We can't let other people tell us what it's all about. We have to know what it's all about. And so, the first few verses of Romans chapter 6 is letting us know that the believer must identify with Christ in death, his burial, and his resurrection. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. So verse 2 says, certainly not. How can we who died to sin live in it any longer? Are you ignorant, verse 3, of the fact that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized unto his death or into his death? The believer must identify with Christ. That's a part of our knowledge. We identify with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So just as we identified in chapter 5 with Adam in sin and condemnation, we are now identified with Christ in righteousness and justification. That's a repetition of chapter 5. What he wants us also to know is that Christ not only died for our sins, but he died unto sin. We died with him. So wherever you see that we are buried with him, we died with him, it means just as Christ died and was buried, the same thing happens with us when we come into Christ. We die unto sin. We die with Christ. We're buried with him. But we're also resurrected with him. And so this makes justification by faith not just a legal matter between me and God. As you said before, it is a legal matter. It's an action. But chapter 6 is trying to bring us into even a more intimate relationship now with me and God. It's a, it becomes not just an action but a living relationship. It becomes a living relationship. So that's what these verses are telling us. We have been baptized into Christ. We were baptized unto his death. 
not only were we baptized unto her, his death, but we were buried with him by the baptism into death. And so just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, we too might live in newness of life. Okay? So we learned about justification, the act of God declaring us righteous. And we learned about that previously in Romans chapter 3 from verse 21 all the way through Romans chapter 5. We learned about justification. But Romans chapter 6 through 8 is going to take us into sanctification. It's going to take us into the process. But we still have to come into the knowledge the knowledge of what Jesus Christ has done for us through his death, burial, and resurrection. And both of them are going to end up in righteousness. Justification, that act, allows us to be declared righteous, but sanctification, that process, also allows us to be righteous. Okay, so that's that's the difference between the chapters that we've already gone through and the chapters that we are now going to go through, chapters 6 of Romans through chapter 8, okay? So so let's begin. <clears throat> um, we have already explained verse 1, that we cannot continue in sin, that God's grace would abound, that even though his grace covers the sin, It doesn't give us uh, the right to try to prove that I should continue in sin in order to prove that his grace covers sin. We can't do this because we are dead to sin, okay? So like I said, I'm in Christ. I'm identified with him. Whatever happens to Christ happens to me. Okay, so we have to look at it that way. When Christ dies, I die. When he arose, I arise in him. The Bible says it like this. I am now seated with him in the heavenlies. And there are a few reference scriptures that we've already gone through. Going back into chapter 5. But we are going to use these chapters as references again to solidify what we're talking about now. So I'm now seated with him in the heavenlies in these 10 verses, verses uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 1 to 10. And the reference for that is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. And the next reference is Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10, in the Amplified Version, it says this, And you he made alive when you were dead, slain by your trespasses and sins, in which at one time you walked habitually. You were following the course and fashion of this world, were under the sway of the tendency of this present age, following the prince of the power of the air. You were obedient to and under the control of the demon spirit that still constantly works in the sons of disobedience right now in this world, the careless, the rebellious, the unbelieving who go against the purposes of God. We were like this. This is what Paul is saying. Among these, we as well as you once lived and conducted ourselves in the passions of our flesh, our behavior governed by our corrupt and sensual nature, obeying the impulses of the flesh and the thoughts of the mind, our cravings dictated by our senses and our dark imaginings. We were then by nature children of God's wrath and heirs of his indignation, like the rest of mankind, but God. So rich is he in his mercy 
because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses, he made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life with which he has quickened him, for it is by grace his favor and mercy, which you did not deserve, that you are saved and delivered from judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation. And he raised us up together with him and made us to sit down together, giving us joint seating with him in the heavenly sphere by virtue of our being in Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the Anointed One. I'll stop there right at verse 6. But you can continue looking at that reference all the way to verse 10. But it basically tells us that we identify with Christ. And so these 10 verses are explaining how we are given the ability to live a life of victory because we are seated with Christ and we identify with him in the heavenly. The next reference that I gave you was Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. If you have just joined us, we are talking about Romans chapter 6, and we're just giving a summary of the first 10 verses explaining how we can live a life of victory and what Paul said um, about us as the children of God, not being the ones that will live in sin any longer, and how we can live that life of victory, okay? And so we're describing that we have references how we identify with Christ. And so we looked at Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 10. I read from verse 1 to 6. And now we're about to look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. These verses are also going to come up as other references to the other points that will be made during this study. So, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3 says, If then you have been raised with Christ to a new life, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead, you see that word, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead, that, that's how we identify with him. He rose, so we are rise to Aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And, verse 2, set your minds and keep them set on what is above, the higher things, not on the things that are on the earth. For as far as this world is concerned, you have died. And your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. Isn't that wonderful? Do you see the correlation? Do you see the relationship that Paul is trying to make? We are in Christ and we identify with him. Whatever happened to Christ happens to us. When he died, we died. When he arose, we arise too, and we arise in him in newness of life. And so, because of this living union with Christ, the believer, you and I, have a new relationship to sin. And so that's what Paul wants to explain, why he starts off chapter 6, verse 1, with should we continue in sin because grace abounds. We have a new relationship to sin. We are different people. So what he is going to explain now in verses 2 through 5 is that the believer is dead to sin. That's our relationship to sin. We are dead to sin. Now, how he goes about explaining that we are dead to sin is that he begins speaking about baptism. And he says it this way, 
in verse 3. Are you ignorant of the fact that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And verse 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by the baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, so we too might habitually live and behave in newness of life. So let's explain baptism. If we want to explain baptism literally, it means immersion, right? It doesn't mean sprinkling. It means immersion. That is total Submit, submission underwater, total immersion under water. And when you describe baptism, it's a burial. So in order to be buried, we don't sprinkle dirt on the coffin. We immerse the coffin in under the ground and cover it with the dirt. So it's the same way. If you're literally explaining baptism, it is immersion in water. Now, if you're figuratively explaining baptism, it means to be identified with, right? To be identified with. And this type of definition of figurative baptism is explained um, by the nation of Israel identifying with Moses, their leader, when they crossed the Red Sea. They identified with Moses. And, and that's explained by a reference in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 2. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 2. If you want to look at it, you can start from verse 1. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. It says, For I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, that our forefathers were all under and protected by the cloud in which God's presence went before them, and every one of them passed safely through the Red Sea, and each one of them allowed himself also to be baptized into Moses. So that's a figurative baptism. That's not the literal baptism. That's a figurative baptism, right? Baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. What that is explaining is that they were brought under obligation to the law, to Moses, to the covenant, consecrated and set apart for the service of God. So that's a figurative baptism is when you identify with someone or identify with a specific thing, okay? So the the verse that we're explaining here in verse, verse 4 of Romans, chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, talking about baptism, is saying by one spirit we were baptized into one body. That's the body of Christ. Okay, we by one spirit, we are baptized into one body, and that is Jesus Christ. Verse 3, are you ignorant of the fact that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We identify with Jesus Christ, okay? The reference for that is 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse... 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. It reads, For by means of the personal agency of one Holy Spirit, we were all, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, baptized and by baptism united together into one one body and all made to drink of one Holy Spirit. So this is Christ. We are baptized into Christ. So the sinner who trusts Christ is immediately born into the family of God. He's immediately born into the family of God. Glory to God for that. The reference for that is going to be Acts chapter 10, verse 34 to 48. I'm not going to read it. 
Acts 10, verse 34 to 48. That's basically the story of Cornelius. Many of you may know that story, where Cornelius was a devout man. And he was praying to God, and God showed him in a vision that he should go and um, get Peter to explain some things to him. And while God was dealing with Cornelius, God was also dealing with Peter. And, and, and the Lord showed Peter a vision of a sheet that came down and had a lot of different animals, and he told Peter to get up and eat. And Peter said, I don't eat things that are unclean, not ceremonially clean. And the Lord said to him, what I have cleansed, don't call unclean. And this was just because he was going to allow Peter to go to Cornelius, who was an alien, who was not Jewish, to tell him about Christ. And so he wanted him to understand the comparison between his vision and when he would get to Cornelius' house, he would understand that, yes, Cornelius was an Italian, he was, he was not of Jewish uh, background, but he would explain Jesus Christ and salvation and Cornelius would be saved, he and his household, and would immediately receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And so, it's letting us know that those who trust Christ is immediately born into the family of God. So what does that mean for us today? It means that we don't discriminate against people because they may not have the same faith as or the same um, beliefs as we do. As long as they trust Christ, that basic Christian principle, we may not all be of the same denomination, but we can still know the value of Christ and what he has done for us. And we also should be examples to lead others to Christ. So that was just brought in to show us that those who trust Christ are born into the family of God, that we allow ourselves to be used by the Lord to be ministers of the gospel. Okay? All right. So let's get back to baptism. Baptism is an outward symbol of an inward experience. Baptism is an outward symbol of an inward experience. It's a picture of what the Spirit does in the life of the believer. So the same way that I told you that literal baptism is immersion, and figurative baptism is identification with, we are baptized with Christ, buried with him. We identify with Christ. We are baptized into one body. And we are raised in newness of life with Christ. And so because of this identification with Christ, the believer has a new relationship to sin. He is dead to sin. Where we see this is Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. That's the reference. The believer has a new relationship to sin. He is dead to sin. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. In him I have shared his crucifixion. It is no longer I who live, but Christ, the Messiah, lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith by adherence to and reliance on and complete trust in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Amen. This is amazing that because we identify with Christ, 
because we identify with his death, because we identify with his burial, because we identify with, with his resurrection, we have a new relationship to sin. We are dead to sin. I hope that you're getting it. So as Christ died completely, so those who profess Christianity must be completely separated and saved from sin. The same way that Christ died completely, those of us who profess Christ or profess Christianity must be completely separated and saved from sin. Why is this? This is because when they become dead to sin, the believer is alive in Christ. We now walk in the power of his resurrection. We don't stay dead. We are resurrected just the same way that Christ was resurrected. So now we walk in the power of his resurrection. We walk in the power of his resurrection. So there is a story in the Bible, and I know that you're going to get this, <clears throat> really get this after you hear the story. For the reference, you're going to write down St. John chapter 11. You're going to read this on your own, St. John chapter 11. And you're also going to write down St. John chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. When I say that the believer is alive in Christ, and we walk in the power of his resurrection, I can best explain it by the story of Lazarus. So we all know the story of Lazarus. Lazarus was dead. He was actually sick. And he they called Jesus to come and help Lazarus before he died. But Jesus deliberately waited, and Lazarus died. And Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death, but that the glory of God might be revealed. So when Jesus actually gets to Bethany, Lazarus is already dead, and we know he raises Lazarus from the dead, right? Lazarus is dead four days. His body even, they said, began to decay. And they said, what are you going to do with him now? His body already is decaying and probably stinketh. But Jesus goes, and he raises Lazarus from the dead. He tells those around him, them, loose him, unwrap him, and let him go, right? There's a reason for that, okay? But after everything that happens in chapter 11 of St. John, he's loosed, he's let go, and probably has just gone back to his, his life. We go all the way to St. John chapter 2, St. John chapter 12 in the next chapter, and what does it say? I'm going to have to read that for you to get this. St. John chapter 12. John chapter 12 says, verse 1, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Why, why am I saying this? Because we were just like Lazarus, dead, bound. Wrapped up in trespasses and sin. Jesus resurrects us. He makes us alive in him. Right? He actually says to those around him, loose him. Take the grave clothes off and let him go. That is what we do as believers when others come in. We help them to, to get those Great clothes off. We help them by spiritually giving and teaching them what we need to teach them so that they can become better Christians. And then in the next chapter, he's sitting at a table and having fellowship 
with Lazarus who was dead. Glory to God. We are now seated in heavenly places. We now have fellowship with Jesus. We who were dead, just like Lazarus, we who were stink in our sins, we who were buried and put aside, the stone was over our tomb. Some of us have have been declared that, they, you know, nothing good would come out of us. Some of us have been written off by family and friends. But God, glory to God, has seen it fit and said, this sickness is not unto death, but that the glory of God might be revealed. There is a purpose for us to be changed resurrected, identified with Christ, and now seated in heavenly places with him, having fellowship with him. Glory to God. And so we identify with Christ. We identify with Christ. We just don't identify with him through that. We share in his resurrection power today. Even now, we have power. We walk in power. We walk in power. We walk, you know, just as it took the mighty power of God to raise Christ, and it's going to take this to bring alive the dead souls of sinners and make them new creatures in just that moment that they say, Lord, come into my life. Save me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so we share in Christ's resurrection power today because we identify with Christ. The reference that I'm going to give you for those two scriptures about identifying with Christ are Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. And we've read this before. This is a repeated reference that we referred to when we were discussing um, uh, Romans chapter 5. It's a repeated reference. So you're going to go back to it. It talks about being seated in heavenly places. So that's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10, that we identify with Christ. And then, sharing his, in his resurrection power, we just read Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. So that's another repeated reference, okay? And so, we can't deliberately, as I'm closing, we can't deliberately live in sin since we have a new relationship, just because of this identification that we have with Christ. We just can't. We cannot live in sin any longer. We identify with Christ as new creatures. So my last reference is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 22 to 24. And then we're going to close off there. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24. This is what that verse says. Strip yourselves of your former nature. Put off and discard your old, unrenewed self, which characterized your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lust and desires that spring from delusion, and be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude, and put on the new nature, the regenerated self, created in God's image, godlike, in true righteousness and holiness. That's why we can't live in sin any longer. That's why the believer is dead to sin. Amen? Amen. May God bless you all. I hope that you have received something that will resonate with you even this week and allow you to know who you are in Christ and continue to walk in his power. God bless you. Tonight, I'm not going to do the... um, the quiz.
I I know if many of you have been looking forward to the quiz, or maybe I'll do one or two two questions, and then we will close off. Um, if there's anyone that was ready for <laughs> the quiz, I will give you maybe one or two or even three questions, okay? So we're talking about, we were talking about last the last few weeks, Romans chapter 5, and we dealt with verse 12 to 21. So I'd like someone to answer this question. And I'm going to give you a clue. Um, we talked about the basis of our justification, what our justification is based upon. And during these 12 verses, I said that there is one word, one, one is that word, O-N-E, and it is said about 11 to 12 times in these 10 verses. That word one is comparing two people. Does anyone remember who those two people are? What? Who is the one man that we're talking about there? Oh, Jesus. Jesus Christ. One man Adam. is Jesus. Yes. And, one is Jesus and Adam. Christ. And Adam. And Adam. Right. Adam Sin. You got it. You got it, Mr. Okay. Farr. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank God you, for the Bible study. Thank you for your teaching. <laughs> All right. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And then, all right, we're going to just do one more question. And so because of Adam's sin, all mankind is under two things. One begins with a C, and the other one begins with a D. They're two words. Because of Adam's sin, all mankind is under C and D. Condemnation. Condemnation. <laughs> Deacon Daffin? <laughs> yes. And death. Condemnation and death. All right. Okay. So we got two for two tonight. Amen. Two for two. Um, Minister Farms and Deacon Daffin got those questions correct. Amen. So we're not going to spend any more time. Amen.